Hi there. I'm Spencer Kelly, and welcome to a world first. For years now, people have been banging on about virtual reality and how amazing it will be one day when someone thinks of something interesting to do with it. Well, we're fed up with the talking, so we've decided this week we are going to do something interesting with it. This week's click has been filmed entirely in 360 degrees for you to enjoy in virtual reality. Good news for you because you don't have to look at me if you don't want to. You can look in any direction you want. You get the full 360. Now, you might be watching this on a 360 website, in which case you can drag your viewpoint around using your finger or a mouse. Go on, try it now. You might be watching it on a VR smartphone app, in which case, give it a wiggle, see what happens. Or you might be lucky enough to be wearing a set of these, VR goggles, in which case, all you have to do is turn your head. So, enjoy the view. This is Click360. To get to our first location, we need a little lift. And then we'll need to walk. So enjoy the view. place to start Click360 than here. Welcome to the Aletsch Glacier in the Swiss Alps. Now about a metre below this snow there's some very important monitoring technology that we've got to dig up. And this is Claudia over here. She started digging. You have, have to give us a few minutes for my lips to thaw and also for us to get in. We're looking for evidence of things called ice quakes, tremors caused by the glacier as it sticks and then slips and bumps along the underlying rock. The theory is that if the glacier melts faster, the increased meltwater acts as a lubricant, which then causes the glacier to slip ever more quickly. Tell you what, Claudia, you didn't have to make me dig the whole hole, you know? <laughs> I'm joking. No. Okay, so, uh, this is the box, can we open it? Yeah, we can. <clears throat> no, no. I knew that. Alright. Right, so what is in here? In here, there is actually uh, this um, orange box where you have the seismometer inside, or the receiver of the seismometer. So, so this is taking measurements from a seismometer which is measuring vibrations from the glacier itself. Yes, and now you have the actually the waveforms of the seismometers um, and that's what is recorded from below and if we do this oh. something happens. Something you probably can't see from there but something happened on the screen. <laughs> that was a cloudy quake. <laughs> What causes the vibrations in the glacier? Um, the vibrations are normally caused just by the movement of the, of the glacier, because each glacier flows. And then the ice cracks when it flows. And then f it creates the crevasses, and when it cracks, it creates also the, the seismic signal. And how will, and that, how will that help our greater knowledge of, of, of glaciers and, and these kind of conditions? Um, 
the goal at the end is just to, when we can um, understand how the glaciers flow, we can better predict what happens in future, especially when we have warmer climates, we have more meltwater, especially. Cool. All yes. right. Carry on about your work. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just to point out, Matterhorn over there. Jungfrau Joch over there. If you want to look around. The research is being conducted by ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and we'll return to ETH later in the programme. For now, as we leave the glacier, let's all sit back and enjoy the ride. spectacular stuff. Now at this point you might be wondering what kind of kit we are using to capture everything in 360. Well that last shot, the one from inside the helicopter, was actually filmed using one of these. This is a Theta and it's got just two cameras, one facing that way and one facing that way. But for better results you're going to need what you're wearing right now. Smile, you are currently a constellation of six GoPro cameras which together capture their entire surroundings. Now this man here, if you hadn't noticed him, is Sol Rogers. He's our 360 and VR expert. Thanks for having us see your 360 labs. Absolutely, no worries. I'm glad guys all came up today. So would you consider this to be the best in class at the moment? Absolutely, this is our go-to system for so many of our shoots. It is six GoPros, as you say, which are consumer cameras, but they are 4K, they shoot 50 frames a second, and they get really close together. So when used in anger, you can make some amazing images. There are absolute consumer ones. So this is one camera, very wide angle lens, and it produces a, a pretty good image, very similar to But Theta. it doesn't shoot 360, it can only shoot what? Almost, upwards. we get a little bit at the bottom. But yeah. we don't have a professional camera system yet. There's a few in the background about to come out, but what I'm really hoping for is someone to invent a spherical sensor. Just one sensor that shoots all wow. directions. Is that even possible, do you think? Scientifically. <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment then, the entire industry is having to cobble together bits of hardware from, from the 2D TV industry. Absolutely, our software, our hardware, even my, my skilled artists are all coming from other industries, games industry, films industry, animation industry, trying to leverage their knowledge and tools into something brand new. But we don't have it all set in stone yet. Okay, and that applies, I'm guessing, to content as well as the equipment. Absolutely, we have 130 years to make film. We're very good at it now, but when it comes to VR, we've only done it for two years. So the directors have only had two or three VR projects under their belt. It's going to take a while for us to get it absolutely right, but it's super exciting, isn't it? OK, well, it certainly is. And we think we've done another world first, actually, for you this week. We have filmed what we think is the world's first 360-degree magic trick. So what we're going to do is we're going to show it to you in 2D, as you would see it on TV, first. And then later on, we'll show you it in full 360 so you can see everything that happened in the room. So have a think about how it might have been done. It's going to pop up over there, and I'm going to hand over now to our friendly magician, Ben Hart. Thank you, Spencer. Hello, my name's Ben Hart, and I'm a magician. Welcome to this, the inside of my brain. Desolate, cavernous, bleak. Anyway, we're not here for therapy, we're here to do a miracle. And nothing says miracle like a plastic glass of orange squash and a painted cardboard tube. Orange juice, tube, concentrate. Concentrate. I've told you, they're not gonna laugh at that. I will cover the glass with the tube. Now the producers tell me I need to bring a bit of pizzazz to the whole thing, so I've got a collapsible magician's top hat. Now, if I cover the top of the glass and squeeze very tightly, I can turn the whole thing upside down and no liquid will escape. Now that's just science, but this is the bit that's magic as I attempt to make the glass vanish completely. <sighs> okay, you got it yet? 
Well, the big 360 reveal is coming later in the programme. But for now, we're going back to Switzerland and heading underground. Welcome to the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. Right now, you're standing inside CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and you've got a view that very few people will ever see. We're about 100 meters beneath the Swiss-French border, and above you is just one of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, itself the largest machine in the world. In a few minutes, we'll head up there, yet yeah, on that cherry picker, to see what happens when you smash particles together at close to the speed of light. But before we do, let me show you what kind of kit you need to get things going that fast. So here we are walking along part of the long circular tunnel that houses the LHC. And that's it next to you. That is the Large Hadron Collider, that collection of magnets. It's a 27 kilometer long loop. There are four experiments on the LHC and 10 accelerators in the complex, which together accelerate bunches of particles up to close to the speed of light. Each section in the tunnel performs a very specific function, from cooling things down to minus 271 degrees C, or focusing the beam, more specifically beams that fly around the ring because there are actually two pipes running in opposite directions and that's so eventually you can smash the two sets of circulating beams together and create conditions similar to those at the birth of the universe. So would you like to see what that looks like? Yes I thought so, me too. This cavern contains the CMS experiment, the compact muon solenoid although there's nothing compact about it if you ask me. This is one of the places that helped to discover the Higgs boson. So that big shiny pipe above you is connected to the tunnels that we were just in. And when the beams of particles are going fast enough, tiny adjustments are made to bring those two beams together until right here, they collide. In an instant, the particles are smashed to pieces. And it's these even smaller particles that the CMS can detect. It's an enormous sensor that looks for the fundamental building blocks of the universe. By using even higher energy collisions, the CERN scientists hope to find other particles and explain mysteries like dark energy and dark matter, which makes up 95% of the matter in our universe. This is big science performed on the tiniest of scales. Okay, we have learned so much about making and filming programs in 360. I couldn't begin to tell you, apart from that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna get technical and dirty for a second. Because once you've filmed in 360 on these six GoPro cameras, you don't just automatically get a virtual reality experience out of it. You've got to stitch those pictures together into some kind of ball that we can then put you in. The man nodding on my right is the man who spent the last few weeks mm. stitching everything together. His name is Steve. How was it, Steve? Awful. It was horrible. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> so how much work is it? Because in one sense, surely you can just get the software to glue the pictures that together. Would be, that would be the absolute dream. And with you know, normal TV, you, go, you film it, you go back to the edit and you put it together and maybe it'll take a day or two. With this, you've got a whole extra step in the middle where you have to stitch this ball that you mentioned. And it looks fine now, but the big problem is caused by these gaps between the, between the two cameras, between right. the six cameras. If you go into them, you turn into a ghost right now. Um, okay. And that, fixing that problem is a, is a huge, huge effort. We've also found that if you go too close to the cameras, there's absolutely no way that you can stitch No, that, so that's going to look terrible. Goodness knows what you're <laughs> seeing right now, but I'll find out Thanks when we so get much, back yeah. to this, please. <laughs> But whether or not VR will be a success isn't just down to the tech. What you can watch and experience will be almost as important. This is a titanosaur. If I was on an ordinary television program, I'd say that it was about 40 meters long, which is as long as three double-decker buses in line, and that it could reach up to the top of a five-story building. We can see for ourselves. 
shall we? We may be the first lot crazy enough to make our whole show in 360, but there's certainly other people out there making really interesting individual 360 stories. A titanosaur was brought back to life in this recent documentary short by the BBC. A great example of how VR can immerse you in an experience that would be otherwise impossible. It can also transport you right to the middle of the action like no other medium can. It can even let you meet people and see things that you otherwise never would. My name's Bioni Sam and I'm an urban beekeeper. The idea of viewing programs in 360 degrees may be a new idea, but a player looking all around themselves in a video game is not. But here is what we think is another first, a video game preview in 360. So while we've been warping space, Mark Chislak is about to warp time. This is a preview of a game unlike any that you've seen before. It's in 360 degrees. It's for a title which supports virtuality headsets, but I suspect most people will play it on a PC or Mac just looking at their normal screen. The premise behind Superhot is the faster you move, the faster time moves in the game. The player is dropped into a variety of perilous scenarios. The environments like this are stark and drained of all colour. The opponents are faceless crimson enemies like this fella. The player punches and shoots and by moving really, really slowly they can avoid the deadly accurate shots of the bitmapped bad guys. It's a really, really difficult game. If you hit once, that's it. It's game over. Practice reveals that it's often necessary to chain attacks to gain the upper hand over the enemies. You have to throw an object at them, grab their weapon and then turn it against their crystalline colleagues. One of the easiest ways of describing it is perhaps like a game designed by the movie director Christopher Nolan at his most inception. This isn't so much of a shoot 'em up, it's more of a slow 'em up. Tactical problems that are generated by the temporal trickiness of the title become combat puzzles which are solved by repeated trial and error and almost endless restarts until you manage to get to the end of a level and you're greeted with the words super hot. That was Mark and now back to ETH in Switzerland where things are getting wet. You're flying above the laboratory of hydraulics, hydrology and glaciology. Below you is a 1 to 45 scale model of the Patrin Dam, which is under construction in Pakistan. And you're en route to the model of an Ethiopian dam, which is even more spectacular. Why are they building these models? Well, the whole point of this effort is to make sure that when the massive, full-size versions are built, they'll withstand the huge pressures that they'll be under. Right, we're half full now, and I've got Professor Robert Bowes with me. And we're just going to move up here. <laughs> Was this just creeping over where we were going to have the chat? So you're the director of this lab. Yes, I am. And what we've got here are two scale models of the outlet pipes that, that are underneath the dam, deep in the earth, underneath the dam. At the bottom of the dam, exactly. Right. Yes. And these are important safety devices for the and the lowering of the reservoir level and they are at some hundred meters below the maximum water level so, so there's a high pressure so the water is going to be a hundred meters above. so the pressure 
of the water that comes through these pipes is going to be huge. It's tremendous. And yeah. This uh, is very challenging from a hydraulic design point of view because um, if this structure fails, the whole um, dam would be at risk. Now it's important to note that what we're seeing here, this is, this is just we're just filling this area at the moment. This is not the pressure or the speed the water will be coming out of the dam when it's full. That, that's, that's the next thing we're going to show you. Um, exactly. That's pretty impressive. That's right. And what's worrying me is, I don't know whether you see over the other side, there's a man putting on some waders. Uh, <laughs> so that says to me we've got to get out of here before well, we, still we get wet. We still have a few centimeters here, but okay. it's a uh, question of time. We will love all this. And this is what full flow looks like. And remember, this is just a scale model. If this were the real thing, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want to be standing or even swimming anywhere near it. This view is good enough for me. OK, that's nearly it for Click360. One thing left to do, you may remember earlier we showed you magician Ben Hart's magic trick in 2D and we asked you how you thought it might have been done. Well, here comes the answer. We're now going to take you back to Ben's studio, this time in 360, so you can see everything that happened in the room. Thanks for watching Click360. This is how we did it. And the slate in, please. 360 magic, scene one, take eight. Lovely. Quiet, please, then, everybody. Ready? And action. Thank you, Spencer. Hello, my name's Ben Hart, and I'm a magician. Welcome to this, the inside of my brain. Desolate, cavernous, bleak. Anyway, we're not here for therapy, we're here to do a miracle. And nothing says miracle like a plastic glass of orange squash and a painted cardboard tube. Orange juice, tube, concentrate. Concentrate. I've told you, they're not gonna laugh at that. I will cover the glass with the tube. Now the producers tell me I need to bring a bit of pizzazz to the whole thing, so I've got a collapsible magician's top hat. If I cover the top of the glass and squeeze very tightly, I can turn the whole thing upside down and no liquid will escape. Now that's just science, but this is the bit that's magic as I attempt to make the glass vanish completely.